You know, no one knows Dr. Marwan's story better than his wife, Mary, and herself a first-generation Arab American. Mary grew up in Westland, Michigan, and graduated from Livonia Public Schools. You know, in 1990, a mutual friend insisted that she meet a promising young doctor who had come from Lebanon for medical training. Well, let's say the rest, as they say, is history. Here to tell us more about her husband is Mary Abuju. Mary? Good evening. It is a privilege to introduce my husband as Arab American of the Year. It is humbling to see the number of guests in the audience and especially touching to have members of our immediate family here with us this evening. As many of you know, the name Abul means father of, and Jude is generosity, father of generosity. And as they say, that's quite a nom, sir. But let me introduce you to the young man that had to grow into such an important name. Marwan was born in Lebanon as one of seven boys. His father, a career military man, rose to the rank of general and instilled in his son the virtues of dedication, integrity, humanity, modesty, respect, perseverance, and generosity. Like most military families, the Abel Judes move frequently, and in the 1960s, while on assignment in Egypt, Marwan, at a very young age, was introduced to the sights and sounds of war. It left a lasting impression. Unfortunately, for a young Marwan, these sounds would re be replayed in different countries at various stages of his life. These sounds would become the opus of his life in the Middle East. In 1975, civil war erupted in Lebanon, and like many refugees, the Abeljudes found themselves in Syria. For the next year and a half, they would be displaced and divided amongst various homes of relatives. At an age when most teenagers were concerned with collecting records and making plans with friends for the weekend, Marwan was volunteering on ambulance runs, helping distribute food, setting up tents and refugee camps. In a time of senseless destruction, Marwan discovered that he loves to care for people, that gratification comes from doing good. While most people were thinking about survival, Marwan was thinking about how to help others survive. Eventually, the Abel Judes were able to return to Lebanon. Marwan was able to resume his education. He approached school with the same tenacity that he approached the war. And in 1979, Marwan graduated from the International College, ranked first in his class, was the recipient of the prestigious Penrose Award. Marwan had seen mankind at its worst, and it brought out the best in him. What better way to help people than medicine? His next stop would be the American University of Beirut Medical School. But then in 1982, Israel invaded Beirut. And once again, Marwan found himself in a war zone. This time, he would head a volunteer group of medical students in the ER. They would collect fragmented body parts, they would care for the injured, and they would sleep on stretchers covered with sheets to protect themselves from flies. Once among the chaos, Marwan awoke to find himself being wheeled out to be placed among the dead. The events of those two weeks changed Marwan's perception of life. He learned to survive not only physically but mentally. The sounds of war beating on him once again had to be muted, so the essence of life and humanity would not be lost. Marwan had seen humankind at his worst. Rather than drown in a wave of pessimism, he found a wave of optimism that carries him through all aspects of life. In 1985, he left his family and his beloved country. He came here with little money, without a job prospect, but with hope, hopes of creating a new chapter in his life. He would never look back on his decision. Eventually, Marwan found a new home here in Detroit at Henry Ford Hospital. Through hard work and perseverance, he earned a residency in general surgery. He excelled. 
although it would have benefited Henry Ford and the community, Formar wanted to start a general surgery practice. He was encouraged to follow his dream and become a transplant surgeon. After completing his training at the University of Alabama and Baylor University with some of the best surgeons in his field, he had many job offers. But it was clear he wanted to come back, come back to Detroit to give back to the community that had given him so much. So in 1994, we found ourselves here again. Two years later, his hard work and determination paid off. Marwan became chief of abdominal transplant surgery at Henry Ford. By 1998, he was awarded the Benson Four Endowed Chair in Transplant Surgery. After this, a series of firsts. The first split liver transplant in Michigan. The first adult to adult living donor liver transplant in Michigan. The creation of the Henry Ford Transplant Institute. Chair of the Board of Governors of the Henry Ford Medical Group, just to name a few. Despite these great accomplishments, Marwa would tell you that they pale in comparison to being the father of our three boys, Monir, Malik, and Bashar. Our family is proud of the selfless work that Marwan does to improve the quality of life for his patients, but more importantly, the acts of humanity that sheds favorable attention to the medical profession, our Arab community, and our heritage. Special thanks to the committed individuals of Access for recognizing my husband as the 2012 honoree and for allowing me to share some of Marwan's stories of struggles and success. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for the warm and uh, heartful introduction. I couldn't have said it any better. <laughs> now everybody knows my secret weapon. <laughs> uh, it, it is very humbling to be here in front of you all, and it's more humbling even to be recognized for something that you do and you think it's a daily way of life. It's more humbling even, and to me it's more awkward when I know that there are so many well-deserving people who do similar kind of work make a difference in people's lives on a daily basis. Perhaps my relief is that I will be accepting this award also on behalf of so many professionals who some of you are here who do terrific work day in and day out. I also want to congratulate Diane Reem. It's such a pleasure to be next to you as an awardee. Uh, I'm a big fan of yours. Uh, you definitely create a soulful program and open dialogue like no other of national scale. And I'm very proud to be with you. Uh, I got to uh, know Access uh, somewhere around 18, 19 years ago when it was a small operation and their dreams and vision were beyond compare. You could see the passion in people's eyes and it was drawing, it was magnetic. And, and you have seen today that Access innovates, Access connects, Access makes a difference in communities, Access makes a better society. And this is the kind of work that we all need in every community. And I congratulate Access for the terrific work. And I thank Access for the terrific award. And I am truly appreciative and humbled by this. And my narrative, as you've seen, is, is really quite common, I think, among many of us who come from the Middle East. Uh, it was a, a very unique life. Uh, at age 13, you grow up to be a man. It's quite simple. You do not debate. You just move on. Uh, you make a difference in other people's lives. And I think that when something happens in front of you uh, where you almost lose your life and you don't, you realize that there is something that you've acquired, that uh, embrace, uh, that enlightenment, and all of a sudden it becomes about others. And that's a transformation that nobody can live unless you're that close to losing your, your life, the life of those you love, or even the lives of people that you've seen minutes before and they are shredded. 
and that is transformative. And I think that, as Mary said, to me, it was not a burnout experience. It was not a bitter experience. It was just a, a glimpse inside the humanity that we all deal with in day in, day out. And when you appreciate it this way, I think you appreciate in people what's best in them, and also you appreciate what is really good in life. It gives you a different perspective. Moldy bread is bread, and a badly done hamburger is still a hamburger, and you'll just put it in real, real perspective. Nothing of what I've done or could have accomplished is possible without many, many other people, and I, and I have to say that uh, I've been so welcomed by the American people in the United States when I first came here. Uh, with very little money, uh, a heavy accent, got better with time. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but I'm French-educated, so it was a little bit difficult to just translate. Um, but there was a lot of warmth in the American people. They, they embraced the warm embrace uh, with the Arab American community and the people in Michigan when I came here. And uh, spending 25 years at Henry Ford in the, in the years that I spent, this is almost half my living years at Henry Ford in Detroit between training and practice. It's almost like qualifies you to be made in Detroit. It sounds pretty good, actually. <laughs> and, and beyond that, though, none of this is possible without the great staff and partners, and especially my family, my wife Mary, and my three boys, Munir, Malik, and Bashar. Please stand up, Munir, Malik, Bashar. You know, uh, we, we always say, you know, my kids, I'm proud of them, and my kids, and my this, and my, my kids are the smartest. But I can tell you, Mary uh, is a mother, is a partner, is a wife. She's a thorough good father, and she even tells me sometimes she could use a wife. <laughs> and, and, and the boys and Mary did not really commit to my lifestyle or to what I do. They got into it because of my choices. And I know they've sacrificed a lot, and there is no way I can pay them back except by loving them every day and providing for them as much as that I can every day. Transplant is very unique, and you cannot do this part-time, you cannot do this on the edge, you either are excellent or you're not in it. When I have personal experiences in the middle of the night, when other people are sleeping, cuddling in the, in the winter under that comforter, and at two in the morning, I'm implanting a liver in a high school teacher, math teacher who can't add numbers anymore because of her liver disease, her liver stop, her heart stops at four in the morning, and there I am feeling the feet. And th literally, her heart is in my hands, limp, as I try to bring it back. And then a week later, she goes home, and I realize what I've, what I've done. And, but at the same time, it humbles you that you just walk around and you stand in line for just about everything else, and you come home, deal with children's homework, and they ask you, how was your day? And I said, it was actually great. It was a great day. And, but when you miss their games, when you miss their concerts, it's not always that they're going to understand at age 6 and 7 and 10 and 12. And you hope that at some point they will understand. And I have to also admire the institution that I work in. Just in the past year, we had this wonderful 21-year-old girl from Western Michigan, college girl, who comes in the hospital and suddenly she's in coma. And unless you are there, you just can't appreciate this. It always brings back these images of death and life, and you're there. And this young girl had maybe 12 hours to go. We bring in four teams together on a Sunday. Everybody's doing their wonderful barbecue on Memorial Day weekend. And then we transfer a piece of liver from her brother, who's also a college student, into her. And of course, she's not aware. She's in coma. He leaves seven days later. She leaves home 10 days later. And they write me a letter to me and my family, thanking me for our humanity, our kindness and compassion, and courage to save their life. And so then you go home, and it's another day, and you go to work, and it's another day. And you turn on, and you go forward. And you realize that you make a difference in people's lives, one at a time. But it's life lived and experiences resurrected, and there's a sense of value that is not replaceable. There are many people who share my narrative. You know, narrative of immigration, narrative of war, narrative of trauma, 
displacement, less money, more money. It's all tangible things that come and go. What really, really puts us all together who share this narrative is our history, our roots. I've uprooted myself. I'm very proud of my roots. You can only go as high as your deep roots go. But I also rooted myself in a wonderful soil in the best country on earth, the United States of America. And, and for those people who share this narrative with me, I would say rejoice, be proud of where you've come from, who you are, and what you've become. But as we rejoice and benefit from the life of privilege, privilege of being in other people's life, this is the pri biggest privilege you can ever have. We all have one common thread that we have to share, and that's our humanity. Our humanity. Because we've seen it when it's there at its best. We've seen it when it's not there. And we live it every day, because we know what it's like. We have the obligation of carrying that humanity forward of seeing what is the best in other people, being servant to other people, and see the privilege of servantship, and also see what is right in this world. So to access friends and colleagues, my Henry Ford extended family, and my personal family, thank you so much for the privilege, and I love you all.